So great to see you all tonight. This is our last Saturday of 2018. Wow. What a year it's been. What a mighty, mighty year it's been. My wife and I have just sat and reflected on the goodness of God for this entire year. And I look at some of you tonight in this room, I think about the times that we had together in Israel. Wow. Wow. I, you know, I was, I was listening. Just a couple more minutes there, Cody. Thank you. <laughs> While I'm meandering and making my way to the message. <laughs> I was thinking about the day when our president acknowledged this year that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel. Amen. I was thinking about, I was thinking about May 14th. 2018, the 70th year of Israel's independence, and us opening our U.S. embassy there. It was just over two months ago, our team was on the property of the U.S. embassy in Jerusalem. What a powerful moment, powerful time, so amazing. It's been a magnificent year, and like all of you, this year has had, it's been full of challenges as well. It's always full of challenges and full of adversity. And it's time for us to just give ourselves to believe, to have faith and honor the Lord and see the Lord prevail and triumph in our lives and cause us to soar like eagles. Amen. He's caused us to overcome. It's been a mighty year. 2019 is going to be spectacular. Mm -hmm. It's going to be spectacular. <laughs> so I just, <laughs> I'm just getting blessed up here. I want to share for just a moment, and if you would, you can write this down tonight. You want to write down the send Dot org, the send. Dot org, s e n d, the send. Dot org. There's an event that's coming to Orlando, and the date is Saturday, February the 23rd. And as you go to the website, you're going to see that Saturday, the, February the 23rd of this coming year, we are going to be going to Orlando. We as a church, we're going to be partnering with Lou Engel, and we were just with Lou. Uh, two weeks ago here, was it two weeks, Brent? Two weeks ago we were together. And, and Lou was here with his team here in Sarasota. And I was able to spend some quality personal time with Lou as well and just praying with one another and over one another as well. God has really spoken to him concerning shifting the call. And most of you are familiar with the call event that Lou has been hosting throughout our nation it's a movement of prayer. It's a movement of fasting, intercession for really an ultimate comeback for our nation, for this generation and the generations to come. And so he is shifting now the call to what is called the send, the send. And we're going to be meeting in the uh, Camping World Stadium. This is a free event, but tens of thousands of believers are going to go there to pray and fast and intercede, and specifically why we are going. Here's a trigger point. In February, it was February the 23rd that Billy Graham went to go be with the Lord. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit had spoken to Lou Engle to look for this sign and to many other intercessors and prophets and leaders to look for this sign that when Billy Graham would pass, that his mantle would be released upon this generation and a wave of evangelism would be launched afresh here in America. The day that he passed, Brent and I had just arrived in Washington, D.C. We were on our way to the Trump International Hotel to be with our friend Dutch Sheets and some other leaders for the turnaround prayer event. Lou was with us. Billy Graham had just passed, and in those three days there in the hotel before the Lord with like 1,300, 1,400 other believers, we began to just go after God 
for this specifically, for the spirit of evangelism, the evangelist, the fire of the evangelist to be released upon the body of Christ. Lou feels specifically to meet here in Florida as a launching pad for this for our country. Come on. Amen. I want to encourage you to join us. And I don't know how we're going to do this because we're going to need to function as victory because it's a Saturday. We're going to have to find a way to function for those that can't go to Orlando. But I know many, many, many of us are going to travel and be a part of this event. So I want you to make plans and make your schedule for Saturday, February the 23rd to recognize we're going to be going to Orlando together to be at this event. You know, Paul, Paul had a spiritual son. His name was Timothy. Timothy was commissioned to oversee the church in Ephesus. Out of any congregation that Paul spent time with, even beyond Antioch, Paul spent time, the most time, imparting into the church of Ephesus. It was the greatest New Testament church flowing in revival and the power of the Spirit along with Antioch. And so um, Paul writes a letter to his spiritual son, Timothy. And in that letter, he says this. He says, now remember, what, at this time, what is Timothy? He's a pastor. Okay, he's pastoring the church in Ephesus. Paul writes him and he says, do the work of an evangelist and so fulfill your ministry. What a charge. He was telling that young pastor, do the work of an evangelist. I remember when Bren and I were at the Trump International Hotel, I remember that Russ and Kim Klein were here at Victory. I remember specifically that not only did Kim Klein give a word, she gave a, a specific word that she saw Vanna White standing uh, like the Wheel of Fortune, and she saw the boxes being lit up, and, and there was a word spelled there, and it said honor. And there was the asking of an E. Can I buy a vowel? And the E lit up, or was turned around, and it had honor with an E, which really perplexed her. She didn't know what that was. She didn't know that Honor Ray was a main road here in Sarasota. She gave a word that night, and she said, the Lord is going to give you a jackpot prize. She's, he's going to give victory a jackpot prize on honor with an E, whatever that means. You remember that prophetic word? We believe that the Lord has a jackpot pro property, miracle property for victory. We believe that. We are in search of that. We are actually in prayer over a specific property right now on honor Ray. But I also want to go to what they did. Russ felt led to give an altar call for those that felt called specifically for the spirit of evangelist, evangelism. Do you remember that? And this altar was filled from over by Aaron to almost over by Doug. I remember going back with Bren and watching the video. And I said, Bren, look at the heart of our young church. Look at the heart. Look at the passion for evangelism in this family. And Russ and Kim went through and prayed for this family. Folks, I believe that 2019 is going to be an extraordinary year of God thrusting us in to the harvest field for the winning of souls. And the other word that Kim gave, she said, we're going to see such a harvest that we're going to see the nets. Remember this, Luke 5? That the, the nets would be so filled, so plentiful with souls that we would have to call out to other partnerships, to other churches, because the harvest would be so great to help us. I believe the word of the Lord. I believe the word of the Lord. You know, the scripture says, believe the word of the Lord and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. That's 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20. Hallelujah. Amen. 
So we're going to be going to the send, and I'm anticipating amazing things. I thank God for Lou Engel. Why don't you put your hands out in front of you? I don't even think we've got to wait to go to Orlando. I just want to declare this blessing in this house right now. Just put your hands out in front of you. Lord, it is our desire for you to anoint our lives afresh. We thank you for every anointing that has poured over our lives, how you have used us in years past. But Lord, tonight we're asking afresh that you would release a new anointing, a new and fresh anointing to win souls, to be a harvester, to be a fisher of men. In the name of Jesus, may this anointing be loosed in our lives. We receive it. We receive it that we will walk in this and we will see your kingdom on such display as men and women and as a family here at Victory. We will be mighty, mighty, mighty soul winners for the glory of the Lord in Jesus' name. Come on, shout amen. Come on, shout amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'd like you to grab your Bibles tonight and go to the book of Job, chapter 39. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Cody. <laughs> Amen. Thank our worship team. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Victoria. Job chapter 39. While you're turning there, I want to speak to you tonight about calling on watchmen and warriors and worshipers. Calling on watchmen, warriors, and worshipers. The hour that we are living in right now actually demands that we be very spiritually alert, that we be ready, and that we be fully awakened. I want to say that again. The hour that we're living in, it demands that we are spiritually alert, that we are ready, that we are fully awakened. We cannot tolerate in our lives spiritual dullness. I want to say that again. We cannot tolerate in our lives spiritual dullness. Spiritual dullness. A mentor in my life many years ago, he said, anything that is cutting edge must be narrow by necessity. I want to say that again. Anything that is cutting edge must be narrow by necessity. You understand that? We must be sharp and we must be sharpened. We cannot be spiritually dull in the sour. And I believe that here at Victory, that young lambs are becoming mighty lions in this house. I believe that. That young lambs are becoming mighty, mighty lions in this house. And God is sharpening us for this hour. We don't know what we're about to behold on planet earth right now. But we are racing. We are literally racing towards an end of an age. You can find this in Matthew 13. Put it in your notes later as you jump into the scriptures and you're alone with the Lord this, this week. Go to Matthew 13 and begin to read about the, the end of an age and the beginning of the kingdom age that literally is about ready to come to the earth as Jesus himself will return as King of kings and Lord of lords and establish his throne in Jerusalem. And all the nations shall move and, and come up into Jerusalem to worship him. He's going to establish his kingdom right here. I believe in our lifetime, in our lifetime, we're going to see the coming of the Lord. I believe that. I want to tell you folks that we're, we're not heading into the end times. We are living in the end times. It's true. There are so many things that are ready to be unveiled to us and to the world. We could literally next month crest into an unfolding and an unveiling of a seven-year peace plan between the Palestinians and the Jewish people. Ladies and gentlemen, if we see that, everything is about to shift. Everything. 
What that will be, that will be a fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, of that peace agreement that will launch us into the final year, seven years upon this planet till Jesus' second coming. Wow. So tonight, I want to speak to you about calling all watchmen, warriors, and worshipers. Have you been talking to one another about this coming year? Have you been asking the Lord for a word for this coming year? I've been talking to many friends, and what is that key word? What, what will 29, 2019 bring us? Where are we heading into in 2019? I don't have a grandiose word on that. This is what I've come to tell you tonight. 2019 is going to be intense. That's what I sense. 2019, write it down, is going to be intense. The Apostle Paul writes this in 2 Timothy. He says that we should live in such a way as a soldier because the days are evil. Now, I know where I told you to turn, Job 39. We're going to get there. I'm I'm making my way, believe me. But he said that we should live in such a way as a soldier because the days are evil. And the enemy is hungry and he's lurking for an opportune moment to attack. And so in Colossians 4, verse 2, Paul says this. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer. And then he gives these two words, being watchful. We are called to watch and pray. That's why we must be very alert. We cannot be spiritually dull. We must be very alert. We must be very sound. We must be fully awakened. We need to be people. We need to be a company of people that we are, we are awakened. We are alert. We are watchmen. We are watchers. And we're watching and praying. We're spiritually at attention. Are you with me tonight? I actually looked up the word intense, (laughs) and it means this. It means extreme force, extreme force, degree or strength. A synonym of intense would be extreme, great, acute, fierce, severe, or high. Intense also means to have strong feelings or opinions, extremely earnest or serious. It means to be passionate. Listen to this. It means to be passionate. It means to be impassioned. Impassioned. It means to be ardent, fervent, zealous, venomous, fiery, emotional. Wow. (laughs) Those are some strong words. I believe this year is going to be very very intense and it's going to be grand and it's going to be glorious I have believed for a long time that the world is actually in for a very rude awakening before they receive a great awakening and I believe that we're in that turbulent time right now where we are receiving in the nations of the earth and in our nation particularly a very rude awakening Because God is shaking all that can be shaken so He can pour His mercy, His mercy, and His grace upon America once again. Are you with me tonight? So in Job 39, I'm actually going to be reading out of the message translation tonight. And I believe Aaron may have the New King James with us, but we're close. So... I'm reading out of the message translation, and I'm beginning to read in verse 19, Job 39. Are you with me? Are you with me? Job 39. And this begins to speak to us of the war horse. Are you the one who gave the horse its prowess and adorned him with a shimmering mane? Did you create him to prance proudly and strike terror? With his holy, with his, excuse me, with his royal snorts, his paws, the ground, who, who paws the grounds fiercely, eager and spirited, then charges into the fray. He laughs at danger, fearless. Hear this tonight. He laughs at danger, fearless. Doesn't shy away from the sword, 
the banging and the clanging of the quiver, and the lance doesn't phase him. He quivers with excitement, and at the trumpet blast, races off at thunder of the war cries. I love that. It's the definition of the war horse. I want you to hear this tonight. Not all breeds of horses are actually created equal. <laughs> Some horses are actually bred for show. Some horses are actually bred for rodeos. Some are bred for races. Some horses are actually bred for riding. But what he's giving here is the distinction of the war horse. The war horse is a totally different breed altogether. And I want you to hear this prophetically. I want to read this over you one more time. Are you the one who gave the horse his prowess and, ador and adorned him with sh a shimmering mane? Did you create him to prance proudly and strike terror in his royal snort? He paws the ground fiercely and eagerly and spirited, then charges into the fray. He laughs at danger, fearless, doesn't shy away from the sword, the banging and the clanging of the quiver of the lance. It doesn't faze him. He quivers with excitement at the trumpet blast. He races off at the thunder of the war cry. See, a war horse is completely different. It's bred completely different. What we see in a war horse, and you want to write these down or get this message later on the video or the audio. A war horse has nostrils that are actually wider, and it enables them to breathe in more air to be at a full gallop. A war horse has eyes that are actually larger so that they can see the battlefield more clearly. Now, I'm preaching to you prophetically tonight. Hear this. I'm not just... First the natural, then the spiritual. Paul gives us this dimension in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, understand natural realities, and once you see that, you'll be able to tap into spiritual dimensions and spiritual realities. So the war horse has eyes that are larger so that they can see the battlefield more clearly. Their muscular structure is more brawny to support the weight of the rider and especially the weight of the armor of that rider. Their hoofs are hardened, resistant to the crippling or the stumbling. The war horse, their disposition is, I will say, unstoppable. They are not distracted or frightened by the arrows that are whizzing by or the clanging of the swords. Hear what he said in Job. They're not distracted. As they're running fiercely, unstoppable into the battle, into the war cry, they're not distracted by the arrows that are whizzing. Are you with me? War horses are not retreating. There are many in this hour in the body of Christ that are in retreat. We're not. Let it, let it be written. <laughs> We're not retreating. Are you with me tonight? God is calling the warriors. God is summoning by His Spirit right now the watchmen. He's summoning the warriors. He's summoning the worshipers. I'd like you to go to Judges chapter 6 for just a moment. Judges 6. And we run into a man named Gideon who really desperately needs encouraged in his hour. Because the, the Midianites continue to come in and rob from the children of Israel continually. Year after year after year this is going on. And the children of Israel keep taking flight into their caves and while, while everything that they've worked hard for is being stolen from them. And so this angel comes upon this man Gideon and he's threshing wheat in a wine press. In other words, he's hiding. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. He's hiding from 
the enemy. And in verse 11, we pick it up where the angel of the Lord comes and sets under this tree awaiting for Gideon. And there he is. He's threshing the wheat in the wine press in verse 11 in order to hide from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and he said, watch this, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Watch this. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. <laughs> Gideon said to him, oh my Oh, my Lord, if the Lord was with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where, is his, where are the miracles of our four, that our forefathers told us about saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Now, if you're not picking it up, let me, let me help you a little bit. Have you ever heard that, that comedy, the, the, strategic, the, the strategy of comedy is actually timing, okay? What makes comedy work is its element of timing. So the angel comes and says, mighty man of God, mighty man of valor. And the next thing that comes out of Gideon's mouth is all the trouble that he's in and unbelief and that we're weak and where is God? And notice this, the, the next verse to follow is this, go in this might of yours. Are you seeing it? The angel just blows right back. All of his excuses, just, it's like he just hurdles right over. It's like the angel's just standing there listening his face is set like a flint. He hears his excuses. He hears his unbelief. He hears his doubt. And his response is, go in this might of yours. Don't you love it? <laughs> Don't you love that? Go in this might of yours. Really? This is what I want you to hear tonight. Because we have to be ready for the hour of warfare. We have to be ready for the hour of warfare. Number one, it will require all of us to come out of our hiding. Come on, don't you leave me up here all alone. Say amen, church. Are you with me? It is going to require every single one of us to come out of our hiding. Number two, it's going to cause us to have to believe the word of the Lord. Believe the word of the Lord. Believe the word of the Lord. And stop making excuses about your own insecurities or about your family background or about your family's portfolio or where they didn't measure up. Stop doing that. That's what Gideon did. Gideon's family was actually idol worshipers. So he started throwing the whole portfolio at him. But you know what? The Lord wasn't buying it. He's like, go in the strength. I've given you the word. Go in it. Somebody needs this tonight. Go in it. Move in it. Move forward. Don't retreat. Stop making excuses. Don't retreat. Go forward. Are you with me tonight? Thirdly, the Lord is correcting our personal. He is correcting our personal identity crisis. He is correcting our personal identity crisis because Gideon was surely in a personal identity crisis. And while we make every excuse not to saddle up with the Lord, he's not buying it. And he's saying, no, you're going to work with me and you're going to move with me because I've got great plans for you. You've got to see yourself different. Woman of God, you are not a slave. You are a daughter of Zion. Man of God, you are not a slave. You are a son. You are a son. And you are mighty, mighty men and women of God. You are mighty, mighty men and women of God. You are mighty, mighty men and women of God. You've got to let your heart and your mind be renewed to how God sees you. You have to allow your heart to come into alignment and agreement with what God says over you. Gideon, you're a mighty man of valor. Victoria, you're a mighty woman of valor. Donna, you're a mighty woman of valor. 
You have to let your mind and your heart be renewed to say what God says over you and about you. You have to come into agreement with it. It will require us coming out of our hiding. We will have to believe the word of the Lord. We'll have to stop making excuses about all of our own fluff and insecurities. Then we will have to, Lord, correct our personal identity crisis. And aren't you glad that God is so very patient with us? Aren't you so glad that he's so patient and forbearing with us to walk with us and hold our hands to grow us and mature us so that we can become mighty war horses? It's where we're going. So he says, go, go in this might of yours. I I find this, it's comedy to me. See, if you believe it, you will become it. What will make you a mighty warrior is believing it. And believing that Christ is in you, the hope of our generation. I love this. It took Gideon a while. You you read these scriptures. go Go through this text again this week. Go through Judges 6. It took Gideon's heart a while to warm up. It took his faith a while to warm up and his vision to catch up how God really saw him. I think all of us can relate to this. It takes us a while for our hearts and minds to be renewed. How God really sees us powerful. But you have to let your heart believe it. You have to let your mind be renewed to how God truly sees you. And I'm telling you, the only way that can happen is by spending quality time with God and letting His Word wash over you and renew your mind and renew your thinking because nothing will make you stand boldly and put your chest out and walk as a soldier in this wicked and perverse generation. It will cause you to stand up when you have heard the Word of the Lord, Him speaking over you as a daughter speaking over you as a son it will cause you to rise at attention square yourself square your chest and walk straight and walk in your integrity and walk in your authority and walk in the mantle that God has put on your life it comes out of spending quality time with God it'll make you stand up when everybody else is bowing low to the spirit of this age and if, this, if there was ever an hour that we need to stand, it's this hour. It's this hour. And don't you misunderstand what I'm about to say, because I know that this could sound a, a little whatever. But I'm telling you, we have, seen, we have seen decades of the church falling down, falling down, falling down. I'm telling you, we're in an hour where the church is going to learn to stand. You better hear this prophetically tonight. God has the power to put you on the floor. You better believe it. He's got the power to stick you to the ceiling tonight like Velcro. But let me tell you what else he has. He has the power to make you stand bold as a lion. Glory to God. There's some Gideons in here that need to hear this. You need to hear that you are a mighty man of valor. You're mighty in God. Someone needs to hear this tonight. Joshua 1 and 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Don't be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be strong. Be courageous. Why do we need to hear this tonight? Are we just perusing and dancing around random scriptures tonight? Is that what we're doing? No. We're getting prepared for the intensity of the year we're about ready to go into at full wind. The winds of adversity are going to blow so strong, you better be ready to stand. My God. This is good for us, isn't it? See, I believe that God is calling every one of us to step into some really epic battles. I believe that God's going to thrust us into 
so that we invade the darkness and that we stop running from it, that we stop insulating our lives from the darkness, and that we run into the darkness with the torch of his presence. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to retreat. We're called to advance. We've been talking about the warrior. Now I want to talk to you about the watchman. Write it down tonight, the watchman. I know this will really resonate tonight with our team from Israel. As you will remember walking on the walls of Jerusalem up in the ramparts. And Ezekiel, I'd like you to go there tonight, Ezekiel chapter 3. I want to give you a moment to go there. And I, I know that we help you with the screens, but I, I encourage you to go there because sometimes... The, the Holy Spirit will breathe something so fresh and you're able to just write it there in your Bible or just in the side margin. I, sometimes I can barely read my Bible because there's so much, there is so much literally written in it. <clears throat> but I want to talk for the next few moments about the watchman and then I want to talk about the worshiper. We're calling all watchmen. We're calling all warriors. We're calling all worshipers for 2019. Amen. God said to the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 17, he says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman. I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word from my mouth and give them warning from me. Now, this is one of the most intriguing metaphors that God uses in all the prophecy. And it's repeated also in Ezekiel chapter 33. You could look at it later. Write it in your notes tonight. But it, it, it's an emphasis because it sets the stage for the prophet's ministry to a divided house. And my God, I think somebody just heard that prophetically. I said it sets the stage to speak a real word to a divided house. All right, three people heard that. Okay, well, you'll get it later. I want to answer some questions tonight. The first question I want to answer tonight is... What was the role of the watchman for the ancient cities? Number two, how does God use the role of the watchman to warn and to teach? Number three, what does it mean for the work of God today as the world is literally coming to a prophetic crossroad? What does it mean to be the watcher? See, it's vital that we understand this and it's vital that we answer these questions because the events around us are increasingly growing very intense. And the world is rapidly changing. Literally, the world order is changing rapidly. What is aligning right now is our Bibles in full spectrum panorama. It is literally unfolding. We're not moving towards the end times. We are literally living in the end times where nations are beginning to align. Where literally a one world government is coming into play. A real antichrist is about to be revealed. The son of perdition. The very beast himself. The antichrist stepping onto the scene. It is coming. And it, it could be coming faster than any of us know. Are you with me tonight? I'm talking to you about the watchman. I just want to stop and say before I go on any longer, I am so glad that I refuse to feed the people that we lead peanuts and popcorn and cotton candy gospel. I just can't do it. I just, I just can't do it. I'd rather go fishing on the ocean or something than get up and give everybody... You know, candy. <laughs> and I've eaten way too much cookie batter during this Christmas holiday already. So. so I want you to listen to these things tonight concerning the watchman. Are you ready? In the ancient world and in the ancient societies, there were the large watchtowers that they were put in place. And what they did is they, we know that they overlooked the fields. And they overlooked the gates and they overlooked the walls. Okay? And don't miss the fields because this, this is very important. Because this goes back even to Gideon's day. Because when the harvest, if you read Judges 6, if you know Judges 6, at, it was at the time of the harvest the enemy always came in and stole the crops and stole the fields. Where were the watchmen? Where the, wa the watchmen were running for their lives into the caves like everybody else. 
So the watchmen overlooked the fields. They, they overlooked the city life. They over, was watching the walls and watching the gates. Because the fields were so very important because the harvest depended upon the survival of the entire livelihood of everyone. So they were watching for thieves that would be able to come in and steal the crops. Are you with me? So we also have several, there's a lot of references throughout the scriptures to the watcher mounting the city walls at a time of stress to survey the scene and to make sure that the, the, the outside fortifications were made. And if they saw a threat that was coming, the watchers or the watchmen would lift up a trumpet blast or the sound of a horn. And what would they do? They would close the gates. Are you with me? They would close the gates. They would fortify the walls. They would alarm the army to be ready to come against the enemies. The watchmen are very important. The watchers are very important. I want to say that the watchmen for this, this region are very important. That's why the watchers have to be very alert. We cannot be spiritually dull. When God calls us into an assignment, we have to take our assignment very seriously. When God calls us into an assignment, we have to take our assignment very seriously. Now, I'm speaking to you tonight as soldiers, as we do here. And so when we take our watch, we have to be alert and watching for the enemy. It's quiet in here. You're thinking. We have a picture of this, and you can put it in your notes. Look at it later in Ruth chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. What a watcher would do, imagine the watcher on his watch, observing daily city life. What would, what would they know? They could see the activity in the streets and in the markets, couldn't they? They could see all the activity. The watchman knew the people. The watchman knew their habits. The watchman knew their work, right? He knew their lifestyles. He knew their coming and their going. Don't you understand that? They were people watchers. They understood their habits. They were watching the culture. They were watching the stream of culture. They were watching people go to work, come to work. They were watching the habits of everybody. The watchers were in their place. They understood the culture. They understood the systems. They, they, could, they could almost predict the flow of the community and the villages of how it was like, it was like schools of fish just swimming through the water. They, they knew when, it, when this street was going to be busy. They knew when this one was going to empty out. You understanding? They watched the flow of life. What were, They're the watchers. The watchmen were in their place observing, looking at society. you got to catch this spiritually. Because in the time of your watch, standing in your gate, in the watch of discerning, of praying and being watchful, the Lord can speak to you in the flow. As we're watching and praying, and I'm not talking about being waterboarded with news. We need to be well informed, but we got to be moving in the spirit and watching and praying. God, give us a word. God, give us a word. Give us your insight. Give us your wisdom. Are you with me tonight? So it's no wonder that the watchman's job was so very, very important. Because the watchmen were truly the prophets. They were the ones that could comment on society's behavior. And then they could deliver the message of warning and instruction. So in Ezekiel chapter 3, in verse 17, he tells them, he says, I want you to warn Israel of its sin and its impending judgment. Son of man, I have made you a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word from my mouth and give them the warning from me. Now, this is a very simple point. But it's very important. Don't you miss this tonight. Don't miss this. Okay? The message is God's message. It was not Ezekiel's message. And let me go on and say it was not someone else's or some other prophet's message. It was a message from the Lord. God never called Ezekiel to be a parrot. You can, treat, you can teach a parrot how to say something. You ever, been, you ever walked into you know, one of those shops and there's a parrot there just saying, Hey, hey Cody, how you doing? Good to see you. Hey, Cody. You, know, you, can, you can teach that parrot to say anything. A prophet is not a parrot. A prophet is not a parrot. 
Ezekiel was not parroting some other prophet's word. He was not coming up with his own word. He was hearing the word of the Lord as a watchman and then declaring the word of the Lord. Don't miss the point. It's always God's message that is delivered through human instruments. It's God's message. It's a warning from God that comes in a language that people can understand for a particular situation, a particular time. We are called to be a prophetic people. You are called to be messengers. Messengers that God can put a specific message in your mouth for a specific time in a specific situation that demands solutions. You are the carriers of those solutions. Amen. Let's read on to verse 18 and 19. He says, when, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning or speak to warn the wicked of his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. I want you to see this. There's a responsibility in bearing the word of the Lord that you, you and I cannot escape. We are, doing no, we are doing no one a favor by staying silent. You're not doing your family, you're not, you're not helping your family or your friends by remaining silent. You have to speak, not rudely, but with wisdom, carefully, and in love. You have to speak the word of the Lord. And he said, if you don't, it'll be required of you. There is a responsibility that God He's not just laying this on those that stand behind pulpits. This is the word for this hour that every one of us have to take this mandate. God is requiring this of all watchers and watchmen. We are responsible. I want to say that. We are responsible. Lord, we will be responsible. The prophet had the duty to deliver a sobering message. Unless the citizens of Israel and Judah acknowledged their sins and turned from their sins and repented. Regardless of how the individuals responded to the warning, they had to hear the message of the prophet. And the prophet had done his job. And if he did his job, he was no longer responsible. Only if the prophet did not deliver the word of the Lord would he be judged along with the wicked. So we read on in verse 20. It gives us another explanation. If a righteous person turns to sin, he would suffer the penalty. But the prophet would also be held liable for not giving him instruction. If the prophet gave adequate warning, instruction, and positive teaching, the righteous could understand the consequence of turning from the right path. This could help him, to, excuse me, this would help him to motivate them to stay firm in their faith and to choose the vindication of the prophet's work. Hear this tonight. We get a sense of the true prophet's message that he shows people how to live, how to maintain their life. It was not just a message that was focused only on people's problems. It was pointing them on how to live the true, abundant, and free life. The key goals of a watcher, the key goals of a watchman or a prophetic people is what? It is to get to the people to turn back to the word of the Lord. It is to turn back to the word of the Lord. Folks, prophetic ministry is not prophetic ministry if it's not turning people's hearts back to the Lord. Everybody and their brother is prophet bucket mouth on Facebook. But if they're not turning people back to the word of the Lord to cause them to come into right living and into alignment with the word of the Lord, it is not prophetic ministry. 
crickets again in the house. I don't understand it. I want to say tonight that the word of the Lord, when it comes from our Father, it is always for our protection. Always for our protection. Always for our protection. A hard word will keep you living right. God is, God is not a slave taskmaster. God is a God of loving righteousness that calls you to walk straight in obedience. When God speaks, it is always for your protection. When our, when our kids were much younger, of course, our, our, ki- our kids are nearing their 20s. Lord, have mercy. But we would always tell them much younger. We would say, we're not trying to steal your fun. We're not trying to steal your joy by turning you away from this. We are saying this for your protection. Parents, mothers, fathers, we are watchers. We are the custodians of their souls. We are the watchmen over their lives. And it's who we're called to be as spiritual fathers and mothers for this very city and for this very region. That we would have eyes to see, that we would have ears to hear, that we would have hearts to obey and step into the hard places and say, I love you, but this is the word of the Lord. I love you. I respect you, but this is the word of the Lord. Here's some good news tonight. The role of the watchman was not limited to just speaking about people's sins or problems in society. The watcher was also charged with proclaiming the good news of salvation. Are you ready for this? I think you are. Isaiah 52, would you go there? 52, and I'm going to wrap it up in just a minute. In verse 7, it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. With their voices they shall sing together. They shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth with joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm. And the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. The watchers are lifting up the good news and proclaiming the gospel. Are you seeing this? But not only that, the watchers spoke to Jerusalem and Israel to hold a vigil day and night for the peace of their people. We sang about that tonight in this house. And in Isaiah chapter 62, if you'll turn there, just a few more pages. Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 6 through 11, it says, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent and give him no rest until he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. My God. It goes on, it says, go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, take out the stones, lift up the banners for the people. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. This is the watchman. The watchman is not just calling out, beware of the sin. The watchman is declaring salvation is coming. Salvation has come. Salvation has come. My God. But we see here, I love this, that the watchman was given the role to charge the people with the prayer vigil day and night, night and day. The watchers were to stand in that place day and night, Night and day, calling out unto the Lord. This is the culture that God has been dreaming about creating for this region. A place of 
burning, unstoppable, unbreakable, unquenchable intercession and prayer before him. What are we doing? We're calling the watchers. We're calling the warriors. We're calling the worshipers together for this hour. The watchers. The watchers. You got five more minutes in you? You guys okay? Second Chronicles 20, would you go there? And I'm going to wrap it up with one of my favorite, favorite stories in Scripture with King Jehoshaphat. Second Chronicles chapter 20. And it happened after that that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. And some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against us beyond the sea from Syria. And in Hezron Temar, which is En Gedi, we were there, if you remember. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all of Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask for help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Notice that. They were a people that came to pray. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God of heaven? And do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hands is there not power and might? And no one is able to stand with you. You are the God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to your descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. I can't read all of this and all of this. He goes on. We're going to jump over to verse 11. He says, he reminds them of all that God has done. In verse 11, he says, he says here they are. Reward us now by coming to throw, to throw us out of your presence. And, or excuse me, throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. I'm losing my place because there's so much writing in my scriptures right now. It says in verse 14, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel. He's a young prophet. He says, listen here. Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid or dismayed or discouraged because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours. It is God's. Watch this. Go down tomorrow out against them. Come out in the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook in the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight this battle. Position yourself. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed, for tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. It goes on and on. And what happens is the word of the Lord is to send out the worshipers. You remember the story. You send out the worshipers in front of of the warriors for the battle is the Lord's amazingly these armies came against them and as the worshipers went out in front what happened the Bible tells us that God set he literally set ambushes against the enemy he literally stirred them up in an ambush in confusion against one another. How did it happen? Because the worshipers went out in front. And when the worshipers went out in front and began to release the song of the Lord, it disturbed the enemy and brought so much confusion into their camp. It literally says they began to destroy one another in verse 23. They literally, it says they utterly began to kill and destroy one another. How did the victory come? The word of the Lord came by the watchers. The prophet, a young prophet, Jehaziel, stood up and said, here's the word of the Lord. Here's the strategy. This is how we go. This is how we move. Do you see it? Do you see the watchers? Do you see the, the worshipers moving together? Do you see the warriors moving together? Do you see it? The three-chord strand. This was the strategy of the Lord. Send the worshipers out. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, he says, The weapons of our warfare, they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The hour that we're moving into is going to be very intense, and it's going to demand the watchers be on their watch. It's going to demand that the warriors be ready to gather and assemble. 
it's going to demand that the worshipers come together day and night, night and day, to let incense arise unto the Lord. It's the way that regions are going to actually become strongholds for the kingdom of God. I've been declaring with you for many years that this region would become a mighty stronghold for the kingdom of God. I believe this year, 2019, is going to be a year of the watchman, a year of the warrior, a year of the worshiper, a three-chord strand that is not easily broken for God to establish his kingdom here and bring victory and bring triumph. I believe it. Amen. Would you stand to your feet?